Another group that comes here might think, that's a really great place. These humans are a real problem. They're detonating all these nukes. They've got all these weapons. And they might be thinking, we can manage that a lot better than they are. How do we do it? We're not really biologically suited for it. Can we create our own avatars and live there? There also is a lot of chatter from fundamentalist religious communities about what UFOs mean or about what uh, the potential for extraterrestrial life means. And it actually just tie in a little bit with what you mentioned there about the possibility of there being uh, other dimensions and that actually, you know, in some way, shape or form, some of the UFO presence that we may or may not be seeing are things like demons or negative spirits, etc. I mean, do you buy into any of that? NASA has quietly put in a bit of funding to theological conferences that have have talked about this and uh, in in one sense i don't know it's i don't know that it's because any of the the great religions of the world know this to be true i think it's more a case that they're hedging their bets and they're thinking if it's true they want to get ahead of the game this time and not get caught up in the sort of science versus religion dogfight that we saw in in the the middle ages for example with copernicus and and galileo do you believe that extraterrestrial intelligence has visited planet earth i think you can go a step further it hasn't just visited it's been here a long time and people talk about the wow signal uh looking for extraterrestrial intelligence the wow signal is that people see it on an almost regular basis that's the communication that's already here. If you had to assign a probability to that statement that you believe extraterrestrial intelligence has visited this planet, what probability would you assign? A hundred percent. In the past few weeks, many UFO sightings have emerged on the internet and surprisingly, they are real. Some of these records have been released under the Freedom of Information Act, a law that allows public access to documents from the United States government. Other records have been leaked by individuals like Jeremy Corbell, who obtained the footage through an anonymous source within military intelligence. In the video, it's possible to see a translucent object with tentacles at a military base in Iraq in 2018, captured by a thermal camera installed on a spy balloon. What's most amazing is that these records seem to be occurring in various places around the world, with several nations applying great secrecy in a broad effort to try to understand what this is and what their presence signifies. However, Stop what lies behind just... this seems to be something that has shocked members of Congress, who have gradually been uncovering the secret investigations involved behind these events. Could these be the real beings visiting us and controlling the ships with impossible maneuvers? What else do they know that they haven't disclosed? Have we discovered that humanity has never been alone on Earth? Everything indicates that their origin surpasses not only distances, but also the dimension in which we are living. I do see them in the day a lot. Look at that, there's no wings, dude. That's what I'm saying, no wings and no wings. Witnesses I've spoken to in great detail who have convinced me that there are, <laughs> brace yourself, human-looking beings, but they're not quite like us. They're here. At every moment, more people are willing to open up about what they know, with some claiming that what lies behind this is staggering. There's no evidence that they've come from somewhere else. We would probably know. We've got a lot of, a lot of technology that's watching what comes in and out of the atmosphere, and there's no evidence of that. I think they've been here forever. Um, I'm, I don't, they're not, I don't, this is my view. Again, it can't be proven, but I'm just telling you after a lot of conversations, um, I think it's likely that the U.S. government has con had contact with these, uh, direct contact, and, you know, over a period of years, I find that really disturbing, um, because I, you know, and, and, a, and a bunch of other things that I, that are highly distressing that I can't prove, and so I'm certainly not going to throw them out there, but I can, I'll tell you this, I've talked to a lot of people about this, not because I've never been interested in UFOs until like five years ago. And I was like, wait, this is real. What is this? Why aren't we talking about this? I'm just like coming at it from a totally idiotic, I don't know anything, curious position, which is my normal posture on everything. 
And so I've talked to a lot of people, and my view is that there, you know, this is my opinion, that there are things about this that are really disturbing. And while I hate any kind of government secrecy, and if I could prove any of this, I would say it immediately, consequences be damned, I do sort of understand why they don't want to let this stuff out. It's not about, oh, we've got fragments of one of these crafts at a Lockheed, you know, facility in California, and we have biologics from the craft. You know, everyone knows that that's likely true. Well, it's certainly true that they have, you know. Even religious individuals have been sharing their opinions on what we are witnessing. Through the true interpretation of the role of the entities involved in the creation of humanity, which, according to them, have been here long before any humans. The prophet Ezekiel telling the story of wheels within wheels, spinning of beings of all kinds around that apparatus he saw in the first chapter and chapter 10 of his prophecy. Or when you get to the apocalypse, you see every creature in the apocalypse that could drive anyone crazy. There are creatures that are eyes made of eyes. Just eyes, 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 eyes outward, eyes inward, round creatures that are living eyes, organic, seeing inward and outward, which are called only, they don't even have a designation. John calls them living beings. John calls them living beings. In the book of Ezekiel, if you read there today, the first chapter and chapter 10, you will see the most anomalous thing in the world. They are beings with four faces and that fly in any of the four directions. They don't have to turn to make the turn. If they want to go there, they go. If they want to go back, they go. If they want to go to one side, if they want to go to the other. They have a vision in any perspective and in any direction. And their feet are not like human feet. Their structure is totally different from our anthropomorphism. And they even have faces that mix faces of different creatures, which Ezekiel at least found similar to the face of a lion, with the face of a bovine, with the face of a horse. It's just a descriptive attempt. Now, who knows what that is? You know, have knowledge that is very, very disturbing. And um, I personally think strongly think um, that there's a spiritual component to this that I don't understand and will not pretend to understand. Um, but I think it's very clear that there's a spiritual component to this. That's one of the reasons the Vatican, and I'm, again, I'm not Catholic, but has been involved in this for over 100 years as an observatory, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that these are not men from Mars. That I think that was a psyop, because I think the truth is a little bit wilder and has deeper implications just than, than that. Recently, a very eventful year in which lawmakers from different parties, in an unprecedented move, began to unite around a crucial issue. The involvement of the United States government with technology and bodies of beings of non-human origin. It is interesting to note that, despite being opposing parties, they are seeking the truth through a joint effort. The previous year, a hearing involving these two debaters caught everyone's attention, suggesting that these beings seem to be not only from another planet, but also interdimensional, making the situation even more complex. <clears throat> um, Mr. Grush, why is it that you uh, refer to the phenomenon as non-human intelligence? Why deviate from the basis of extraterrestrial life? Uh, I think the phenomenon uh, is... Uh uh, very complex, and I like to leave an open mind analytically to specific origin. When you say specific origin, are you referring, can you elaborate on that for those that might not? If it's a traditional extraterrestrial origin or something else that uh, we don't quite understand uh, from either a biological or astrophysics perspective, yeah, I just like to l keep an open mind on what it could be. Yeah. In terms of uh, multidimensionality, that kind of thing, the, the framework 
uh, that I'm familiar with, for example, is something called the holographic principle. Uh, both, uh, it's, it derives itself from general relativity and uh, quantum mechanics, and that is, if you want to imagine a uh, 3D object such as yourself casting a shadow onto a 2D surface, uh, that's the holographic principle. So you can be projected, quasi-projected from higher dimensional space to lower dimensional. It's a scientific trope that you can actually cross, literally, as far as I understand, but there's probably guys of PhDs that we could probably but, argue about that. But you have yeah. not seen any documentation that that's what's occurring. Uh, only a theory. theoretical framework discussion. The information was shared shortly after the meeting held in a closed environment in the secure room. The secure room in the American Congress, known as a sensitive compartmented information facility, was built in 1857. It's primarily utilized for confidential meetings and discussions on sensitive matters. Journalists waiting outside observed some lawmakers like Robert Garcia leaving shaken as if they had witnessed something that defies comprehension. Regarding the phenomenon, the interdimensional aspect raises concerns that were discussed in interviews after the meeting. One member used the term that what they were exploring here were, per phrase, interdimensional beings. Is that something that we're dealing with here potentially? I mean, I think it's easy to be disappointed when you don't get all the information that you want, which I understand. I, I would have loved to receive much more information, but I think, I think that um, it's, it's reasonable to say that uh, everyone that was in the room uh, received probably new information. I, I certainly did, and I think that's an interesting um, you know, additional information to continue the investigation um, and ask more questions. So definitely have more questions than, than less questions. Does that, does that term mean anything to you? I'm not going to get into any, any terms. I just think that it's more important to focus on that there's, this is a serious topic and it deserves um, serious attention. And I actually encourage also members of the media to continue covering this topic. I think that's really important. Um, it, it is not a fringe topic. It is a serious national security topic. So can you tell us a little bit about what he's explaining there, the holographic theory, and how that might help us understand the technology that UAPs or UFOs are using? I don't think that's very relevant. The, the holographic principle uh, is a concept that considered in the context of string theory in a way of unifying quantum mechanics and gravity in the context of extra dimensions, meaning we know of three dimensions of space and of time. And string theory argues that in order to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, the two pillars of modern physics, they need to consider additional spatial dimensions. And then they have proven mathematically some equivalence between quantum field theory and gravity within those extra dimensions. That's, uh, first of all, not known to be a description of reality. String theory is a purely mathematical concept at the moment. We don't know whether there are extra dimensions. Uh, theoretical physicists talk about it for decades, but we have no clue whatsoever that there is any extra dimension beyond the three spatial dimensions we have. So mentioning that in the context of technology is completely inappropriate because we don't know whether uh, even there are extra dimensions and whether it applies to the reality that we all share. It's just a mathematical concept at this point within string theory, which is not proven by any means to be correct. There was no experimental evidence for string theory and we don't see any prospect for getting experimental evidence in the coming decade. This detail brings a new dimension to the mystery, eliminating arguments that spatial distance is a barrier to extraterrestrial visits. Anna Paulina Luna, an American politician serving in the United States House of Representatives, a member of the Republican Party, in her statements not only reinforced the credibility of David Grusha's testimony, but also emphasized the importance of his revelations. She mentions that if there was any doubt about Grush's credibility, that doubt was dispelled after the meeting. One name that was not mentioned during the meeting but was brought up by Luna is Bob Lazar, one of the first whistleblowers. She believes that if Lazar becomes a witness in Congress, testifying under oath alongside Grush, it may help clarify these situations. She mentioned the possibility of Lazar leading a list with 22 names involved in a reverse engineering project in the 1980s, carried out at Area 51. In the past, Lazar had already hit some predictions, including the existence of Area 51 and Element 1-15. to Later, 
With the tic-tac video and the way the craft moves, he had also mentioned several other advanced technological information for that time, which are now part of our daily lives. But you could at least admit the one thing that we kind of agree on at this point, that there is another civilization visiting us. Well, more than that, it, um, I mean, because it utilizes gravity, it actually distorts time. So it can travel more than just out of the solar system. And, you know, there's no guarantee that these were aliens from another planet. I've heard people throw out theories that it's just us from the future coming back to visit. I can't discount anything like that. That could easily be true. So whether this is from people from another dimension, us from the future, or creatures from a distant star system, that all remains to be seen. In recent weeks, Jeremy Corbell released a new documentary that included an interview with Lazar, where he made it clear that he would prefer to remain silent, but would consider testifying if Congress guaranteed that nothing would happen to him. Another person who has been providing detailed information about this is Grush, who, unlike Lazar, has an impeccable record within the government's secret areas, and therefore his credentials are easily verifiable. Based on your experience and extensive conversations with experts, do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials? Something I can't discuss in public setting. If you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries, yeah. Were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness, like how would that be determined? The specific documentation I would have to talk to you in a skiff about. The concern over the transparency of the Pentagon and the use of taxpayers' funds in the United States is a central point of investigation. This becomes even more relevant when considering that the Pentagon has not been fully transparent about managing the billions of dollars spent since 1947, and these expenditures have never been properly accounted for. Since the money spent by the Pentagon comes from the taxes of American taxpayers, it is understandable that they would want to know how these funds are being utilized. I think it's time for this country to take back our country. We need to tell the folks at the Pentagon they work for us. Government, we don't work for them. And that's exactly the point. This is an issue of government transparency. We can't trust a government that does not trust its people. We're not bringing little green men or flying saucers into the hearing. Sorry to disappoint about half y'all. We're just going to get to the facts. As a member of Congress, you believe that our government knows far more about alien life than they are willing to tell us. Um, and, and, and you believe that? How, how, how certain are you of that? 100%. I guess if you could, uh, if I was Yogi Bear, I'd be 150%, but I'm just 100%. <laughs> I've talked to too many pilots. I've talked to too many scientific, people in the scientific community and just just regular folks that have risked their whole lives, I mean, their, their livelihood, literally, by coming forward and telling me about these things. I've seen pictures. I've talked to people. It, I, you know, I, I'm not saying I know everything, but I do know this, is that this thing has been a cover-up since day one. And I, our I federal guess our federal government wants billions more dollars to study something they say that don't exist. And they've been spending hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of millions so far on it. And then they claim they weren't. They got they got caught in it. And now they're they're backing up. And now they're saying, oh, there's something out there. Give us each department of government from the FBI, the CIA, NASA. Um, you just go down the list. Our military, all of our military branches, they're going to want more money to guess what? To study these things. Right. And it's just a it's just been a cover up from day one and they hand them off to the military military defense contractors years ago and there's a separation there so you all in the media can't address it through FOIA because these are private enterprises our pentagon do you honestly believe that our pentagon has lost 50 percent of their assets and we've rewarded with what 20 40 billion more oh, wow. dollars this year for their great work i mean this is ridiculous this is only in America, in our federal government, where we, we, we treat the people like this. And this is what's going on. And, you know, and like I said, I, and you've talked I'm, being, to... 
cut because of it, but it's the truth. Get them on here and, and deny anything I've said. The fact that private companies can be called as witnesses in this process, one of them being Lockheed Martin, responsible for many high-tech projects, including one of the most powerful and recent generation five fighters, the F-35. Also on the list is Northrop Grumman, responsible for the invisible and feared B-21 Raider. In fact, there is mention by Congressman Tim Burchett stating that recovered UFO technology may be being reversed at the moment, but we do not understand how it works. Even John North, the founder of one of the companies that gave life to Northrop Grumman, had mentioned something about it back in 1975. Aircraft are thoroughly modern and up-to-date based on our present knowledge, but there is absolutely no question in the world but what there is not only a source of power of which we're not acquainted, but there is also a source of propulsion which we're not acquainted because the UFO seem to have unlimited power, which perhaps could we might obtain if we develop uh, uh, fusion. Fusion power uh, is more or less goes on forever. Fission that we're using now utilizes the, the elements to a certain extent, but fusion recreates the material that's used. And perhaps a, fuse, a small fusion power plant would give you the power necessary. But the, the propulsion of these UFOs is unique. Their ability to hover, their ability to accelerate very rapidly, their ability to, to move at very high speeds, very much higher than anything that we have achieved even with our supersonic aircraft. All of these things and particularly interestingly without sonic booms and the things that we don't like about our supersonic aircraft, all of these things indicate a type of propulsion which is unique, different than anything we know anything about, and which would be of tremendous value if we could develop it and use it. I don't believe they are aerodynamically powered. I don't think that there is any aerodynamic uh, particular value to their shapes. They come in a number of different shapes, all the way from a flattened sort of pumpkin shape, flattened sphere like a pumpkin, to elongated sort of cigar shapes, to the well-known flying saucer shape, which consists of a saucer with another inverted on the top of it. And uh, this type, uh, accounts for about 50%, but the flight characteristics of all of the different shapes are similar. In other, all, in other words, they've all been seen to accelerate rapidly, to be able to stop, to be able to turn rapidly, to be able to hover at will anywhere they want to go, so that the type of suspension, propulsion, whatever it is, that enables them to behave in the fashion they do is something that we simply have no technical background for at the present time. However, Dr. Hal Puthoff, a theoretical and experimental physicist, explained that as we unravel the technologies that make space travel possible, we must consider the possibility that other civilizations have already traversed this path before us. This opens the door to the possibility of extraterrestrial visits. One of the discoveries that emerged out of uh, modern quantum theory is that uh, so-called empty space isn't really empty at all. It's actually full of energy. So instead of being like kind of a quiet, empty lake, it's more like the froth at the base of a waterfall or something. And this energy is basically electromagnetic in nature. And uh, <clears throat> the energy density is uh, quite high. In fact, it's so high that when it was first discovered mathematically, it was thought to be some kind of artifact of the mathematics. But then as time went on, there were an even Nobel Prize winning experiments that showed that this energy in so-called empty space was really there. We don't usually notice it because um, it's so homogeneously distributed. It sort of be like sitting in a bathtub with uh, at exactly your body temperature. You might not notice notice the water, but under certain circumstances, it can be um, disturbed or perturbed, and then it has has effects. As I mentioned, some some effects on atomic emission, for example, is what eventually ended up uh, in a Nobel Prize for Willis Lamb of Yale University and it's called the Lamb Shift. And this is a recognition that in fact, uh, this energy disturbs atoms. So atoms aren't sitting in a void, they're sitting in the sea of energy. So once uh, quantum theorists realized that energy was there, the next question was, well, <clears throat> is there any way to tap it? From the early videos in 2017 to the recent discussions on interdimensionality in 2024, the speed at which this subject has advanced is noticeable. 
The role of politicians, such as Congresswoman Anna Polina Luna and other members of Congress, has been crucial in this regard. In recent weeks, Corbell presented a documentary featuring some military video recordings. One of them is the Jellyfish UFO video. The recording shows an object flying over the American base in Iraq in 2018. But having somebody stand up there under oath in front of Congress and say, we've been reverse engineering UFOs, they represent non-human intelligence, not just craft, but biologics, which means bodies. And the fact this was said in a public realm, and now Congress, and they've been seeking answers, are starting to understand the gravity and the weight that this is true. I mean, it's really a historic moment. I think that's going to sink into people in a little while. Is it coincidental that it is this week that the jellyfish video um, ended up being released for all of us to see? And then there's this hearing. And as an addendum to that, do you think that that particular video was discussed today? All I can say is that uh, being a strategist, what's really important is that we can make a lot of noise and get things into public consciousness when it will be, have most effect. Now, th this meeting has been on the books for a while. Uh, George Knapp and I have been sitting on this footage for about three and a half years. We've been trying to figure out the best way to get it out if we can verify it from firsthand witnesses, which we sure did. So as we unfold this story, it kind of seems like perfect timing today, right? Michael Sinkowski, a soldier who was at the base at that time, said that sightings like this began in late 2017 even mentioning that at one point they tried to shoot down the object, but without success, and that after that, these encounters began to be internally treated as something spiritual. Yes, we are talking about ghosts. We called it the uh, the spaghetti monster among the Marines on the base. And it was just, when they were showing me, it was just this kind of a cool story of, of something weird that happened. Everybody had their own different theories on what it could be, but nothing that could totally explain the, the phenomenon. And we would show people that would come into the COC uh, the video and you know they would think it's super weird and come up with their own theories. And nobody really thought anything further into it because we never saw anything like that ever again. And uh, I, I never thought I'd actually see that video ever again after I left my deployment. I told a few people about it once I got home, but obviously I didn't have the video or any of the, the recordings to back up my story so people probably thought i was you know so Stephen, we went around earlier and i had people say what their best guess was uh, about what the object was what what's your best guess i would have to say interdimensional space ghost <laughs> <laughs> after meticulous analysis of the videos suspicions were raised about the possibility of a smudge on the camera lens but analysts dismissed this hypothesis based on the clarity of the image. The object, apparently three-dimensional, exhibits distinct movements and temperature variations, where the lighter color is colder and the darker colors are hotter, suggesting a possible intelligence behind its control. Skeptical analysts attempted to offer alternative explanations, but all agree that the captured object is real. The color change of the object in the video correlated with temperature alterations is a significant point for this understanding. Eyewitnesses, including military personnel, assert that the object was not visible to the naked eye, being detected only by thermal cameras. As it passes through different elements like animals and soldiers, it is discussed as a possible sign of intelligence controlling heat emission, further complicating the understanding of the object's nature. The video in question is only a few minutes long, but Corbell claims that the original video is 17 minutes and promises to publish the entire video soon. On September 11, 2009, a similar recording was made with the same format. Around it, there were three objects circling, and after a few seconds, it simply disappeared. However, upon closer observation, frame by frame, it is possible to perceive that it not only vanished, but shot upward at high speed. Some sources claim that one of the Pentagon's major concerns regarding these events is related to the ability of these objects to destabilize military equipment and sensors. 
in addition to the disclosure of advanced technology associated with them, which theoretically could pose a threat to global stability. Does the discovery of innovative technology have the potential to collapse civilization, depending on who possesses it? That's why they have justified these secret programs for recovery and reverse engineering attempts of objects apparently not of human origin. However, some go even further, saying that the real fear lies in something deeper, involving the soul, causing such disruption to the population that it would be impossible to calculate the impact this discovery would have on society. In your opinion, does that make sense? Let us know in the comments what and from what origin you believe these beings would have. Reports of recovering these objects and beings have been around for a long time. But what draws a lot of attention is the year it all began, 1947. The same year the Pentagon seems to have initiated its programs. One of these whistleblowers was Leonard Stringfield an American who dedicated himself to studying cases of crashes and recoveries of these objects, being one of the first and most respected researchers on these cases. Stringfield published several books and reports on the subject, the most famous of which is the series UFO Crash Retrieval Status Report, divided into two parts. In the first part of the book, he presents accounts from people who claim to have seen or participated in UFO recoveries and encounters with their occupants some of whom were alive or dead. He describes the physical characteristics of these beings, reporting conversations with doctors who examined bodies of beings found at UFO crash sites. The beings had distinct characteristics, such as large heads, a height of about one meter and 20 centimeters, small noses and mouths without ears or hair. Their hands had four fingers, with one of them being twice as large as the others. Their brain measured 1,800 cubic centimeters, compared to the human average of 1300. The skin had a texture similar to the granulated skin of lizards, and during the autopsy, a colorless liquid was noted in the body, without red blood cells, lymphocytes, or hemoglobin. Additionally, no digestive system, alimentary canal, or rectal area was found in the examined beings. In the second part of the book, Stringfield reviewed new evidence about some of the most famous and controversial UFO cases in American history, attempting to understand the possible origins and intentions of these beings, as well as the reasons for the cover-ups and lack of information from authorities. What is striking is the number of bodies and craft in possession of the United States, starting in 1947, in one of the most famous cases in history, Roswell, New Mexico. We've been working on a special about this case for several months and should publish it in the next few days. On July 22, 1947, the Roswell incident occurred in New Mexico with the discovery of four bodies. On February 13, 1948, in Aztec, New Mexico, 12 bodies were found. On July 7, 1948, south of Laredo, Texas, one body was discovered. In 1952, in Spitsbergen, Norway, two bodies were found. On August 14, 1952, in Ely, Nevada, the discovery of 16 bodies occurred. On September 10, 1950, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, three bodies were found. On April 18, 1953, Another incident occurred in southwest Arizona where no bodies were found. On May 20th, 1953, in Kingman, Arizona, one body was discovered. On June 19, 1953, in Laredo, Texas, four bodies were found. On July 10, 1953, in Johannesburg, South Africa, five bodies were discovered. On October 13, 1953, in Dutton, Montana, four bodies were found. On May 5, 1955, in Brighton, England, four bodies were discovered. 
On July 18, 1953, in Carlsbad, New Mexico, four bodies were found. On July 12, 1957, at Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico, two bodies were found. On November 10, 1964, in Fort Riley, Kansas, nine bodies were found. On October 27, 1966, in Northwest Arizona, one body was discovered. Between 1966 and 1968, there were five crashes in the Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio area, resulting in three bodies and one intact craft. On July 18, 1972, in the Sahara Desert, Morocco, three bodies were found. On July 10, 1973, in Northwest Arizona, five bodies were discovered. On May 12, 1976, in the Australian desert, four bodies were found. On June 22, 1977, in northwest Arizona, 11 bodies were found. On April 5, 1977, in southwest Ohio, two bodies were discovered. On August 17, 1977, in Tabasco, Mexico, two bodies were found. In May 1978, in Bolivia, wreckage was found without bodies. In November 1988, in Afghanistan, seven bodies were discovered. In May 1989, in South Africa, two living beings were found. In June 1989, also in South Africa, two bodies were found. And finally, in July 1989, in Siberia, Russia, nine living beings were found. Unfortunately, the list only goes up to 1989, but it could be even more extensive. With this high number of records, if they are real, they reveal that they are here in large numbers. And we can make this statement with only a small fraction of time that this list represents. So the question arises, how many more of these events must have happened, and how many of them are still happening? So, and, and you may or may not be able to answer my last question, and maybe we get into a skiff at the next hearing that we have, but who in the government either, what agency, sub-agency, what contractors, who should be called into the next hearing about UAPs, either in a public setting or even in a private setting? And, and you probably can't name names, but what agencies or organizations, contractors, et cetera, do we need to call in to get these questions answered, whether it's about funding, what programs are happening, and what's out there? I can give you a specific cooperative and hostile witness list of specific individuals uh, that were in those. And, and how soon can we get that list? I'm happy to provide that to you after the hearing. Gary Noen, a renowned pathology professor at Stanford University, has been studying materials from supposed unidentified aerial phenomena and the neurological consequences of people who claim to have had encounters with UFOs. He claims to believe 100% that these extraterrestrials not only visited Earth, but have been here for a long time and may still be among us today. And he believes that the United States government is aware of this. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. What is it? You know, I wish I knew, and of all the people that I've spoken with on the inside, there's uh, really very little unanimity about what it is, except for that there, whatever it is appears to be so far advanced from us that it beggars understanding. So you don't think it's human? Oh, I'm sure it's not human. Is it intelligent? Yes. It certainly acts it. And in some cases, it seems to have a sense of humor. So Gary, the, the implications of what you're saying there are enormous, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You're suggesting that there is a highly advanced civilization that is intelligent, mm -hmm. it's not human, mm -hmm. and it's real. Yeah, I almost hesitate even to call it a civilization. A civilization implies uh, a lot of interacting parts uh, that are moving towards some sort of goal. I couldn't even say whether or not what it is that is being observed is something like that. 
Now, the classic explanation for years, and the reason everybody giggles, is because they're immediately thinking of little green men from mm -hmm. Zeta Reticuli. Mm -hmm. Do you think the, the highest probability is that whatever they are, they are extraterrestrial? I don't think so, no. I think it's whatever it is, it's been here a long time. So, and certainly it's been here longer than we've been civilized. So at the very least, uh, who really owns the planet? Who was here first? Uh, I'm not sure it was us.